This is part three of my Hyperbolica devlog, and I want to start by talking about some design philosophy. Remember that four-dimensional game, Mia Gakure? It's been in development for over 10 years now, and I used to think what could possibly be taking so long? Well, I know now. It's the lack of tools. Want to make a 4D model? Well, you can't use Blender, there's just no 4D editors out there. What kind of file format would you even save it to anyway? There aren't any game engines that would read it. The same is true for rendering, it has to be all custom. You have to make your own level editor, physics engine, lighting models, optimizations. Basically everything needs to be redesigned from scratch. And I realized very early on that the same is true for non-Euclidean geometry. And so all the design decisions I made for Hyperbolica revolved around trying to hack ways to use existing tools as much as possible to minimize how many things I'd have to build from scratch. That plus limiting the scope of the game. That's the only way I'd be able to finish in a reasonable time, and also why I went with Unity as the game engine. There's just more tools and support for it. The first thing I thought about was designing the levels. Building a hyperbolic editor would take a long time, so instead I decided to use a technique called tile mapping. It's actually really common in games, lots of them use it. Instead of building one gigantic landscape, you just connect a bunch of smaller tiles together to form it. The only difference in hyperbolic space is there's a different number of tiles around each corner. To make things even simpler, I only use square tiles, and I just change the number of squares per vertex to get different curvatures on different levels, including spherical. When it comes to placing those tiles, a grid would be really nice because I could just place a tile at, say, 5 comma 4 and that's it. But you can't do that with hyperbolic grids. Remember, up right is a different coordinate than right up. Integer pairs won't work. So I just took the lazy way and just represented tile coordinates as a string of steps from the origin. So this would be the RU tile, and this one the UR tile. To build the grid, I start at the origin and then recursively expand in all four directions, breadth first. If there's already a tile there, then I just skip it and move on. In Euclidean space, it's easy to plan out a level on paper, but I can't do that in hyperbolic space because there's no good way to physically draw it out on flat paper. And again, I don't want to spend time making a big level editor, so I came up with something easier. Just use the game itself. I just fill the entire level with debug tiles that print their coordinates, walk over to the part of the level I'm working on, and then write down which tile goes where and at what orientation. I can preview how that looks, walk over to another section, and then just keep doing that. Less important areas can just get filled in procedurally. It's not the most efficient, but it was fast enough and worked for me. Now for the big elephant in the room. How do you actually represent a position? What coordinate system can you even use? And how do you transform the tiles, or the player, or objects, or anything? Before I answer that though, Here's a quick refresher for how this normally works in 3D games. So there's this concept of a transformation matrix. It's a 4x4 matrix that typically represents an object's rotation, translation, and scale. What's really nice about this is you can multiply these matrices together to combine a bunch of transformations into just one matrix that gets sent to the GPU. This makes it really efficient and easy to understand conceptually. Well, it turns out that the same abstract concept of a transformation matrix also works in non-Euclidean geometries, but with something called gyro vectors. If you've never heard of gyro vectors or gyro vector spaces, you're not alone. They're a really novel concept. I couldn't even find a single YouTube video about it, but they are so useful. At a high level, it works exactly the same way. It's a structure that has a rotation and translation. It's just that the multiplication part is a little more complicated than a matrix multiply. Luckily, that's all hidden away in the code, so you don't even have to worry about those details. Well, sort of. It has some different properties. Like, normally, translations are commutative. It doesn't matter what order you do them in. But gyro vector translations are not. Remember, up right is a different coordinate than right up. Also, the resulting gyro vector can end up with a rotation even though the ones on the left didn't have any. That's the gyro part of the gyro vector, and the result of holonomy, which I talked about in a previous video. Gyro vectors are also non-associative, unlike matrix transforms, which is kind of weird, 
But we did drop the parallel postulate. So of course we'll have to drop some symmetries that we take for granted. Anyway, the original paper applied these to points on the Poincare ball model, the stereographic projection. And so those are the coordinates I use internally. With a few changes, it can also work with hyperboloid coordinates, but for some reason that seemed to lose precision more quickly. So here's how the render pipeline looks now. There is basically just an extra step in the vertex shader to apply the gyro vector transformation. This warps the vertices to the correct spots, and ta-da! We're rendering hyperbolic geometry from the player's perspective. And in case you're wondering, to render spherical geometry, it's mostly just changing a bunch of minus signs to plus signs, and hyperbolic trig to regular trig, but there's a lot of really tricky subtle details here that I'm leaving out, so I'm going to talk about some of those challenges in the next video. Stay tuned for that, and thanks for watching.